Bailey. Heather Hopper. Fred Allen. Star on Family Theater. The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents Hollywood Story, starring Dan Daly and Hedda Hopper. Brief portions are transcribed. Fred Allen is your host. This is Fred Allen saying thanks for inviting us into your homes at this time. It's nice to know there are so many millions of families listening to Family Theater each week. It's encouraging to know that your interest and enthusiasm for the program have been responsible for the remarkable growth so that now it is heard on over 400 stations in the United States as well as in Canada and other parts of the world. Because you know, Family Theater is dedicated to your family, to all families. It is dedicated with the simple conviction that our homes are for us the most important places in the world, and each of us has an important job to do in keeping our family together and happy. We join with so many of you in this conviction and in the conviction that family prayer brings a new understanding and harmony into your homes. Because with God's help, with the help of daily family prayer, our hearts are lighter, our homes are happier, and there is given to our families a broader, brighter viewpoint of tolerance and understanding. Fred Allen returns following Hollywood Story, told by Hedda Hopper and starring Dan Daly. Hello, everybody. This is Hedda Hopper bringing you another Hollywood story. Tonight, it concerns the fortunes of Terry O'Rourke, a young writer who had one desire in life, a burning desire to own a big, big swimming pool and to have an Oscar standing on the mantel in his living room to look at when he came out of his plush pool. It's the story of a young guy who woke up one morning and wished he'd never been born. It's about a guy who met a girl, and together they had a dream. It began one evening a few years ago. Janie Powers, a young actress, her agent, Monty Rocco, and myself were seated at a table in Ciro's. A man, handsome, charming, and with eyes for no one but Janie, came over. Hello, Monty. Hello, O'Rourke. What can I do for you? I'd like to meet Miss Powers. Some other time. Oh, don't be difficult, Monty. Who is this young man? Terry O'Rourke, a bee writer I met. I forget where. How do you do, Terry? Congratulations on your last picture. I hear it's a sleeper. I didn't know you paid any attention to pictures that only show on the wrong side of the tracks, Miss Hopper. Oh, I get around. Mr. O'Rourke, Janie Powers. Hi. How do you do? Would you dance with me? Well, I... Oh, go on, Janie. If you don't, I will. Excuse me. What have you got against him, Monty? Oh, nothing personally. He's just a smooth-talking, fast operator, that's all. I don't like the type. Janie, I'm very much in love with you. I love you too, darling, distractingly. I'm serious. You don't know me. We were only introduced a few minutes ago. You are 20 years old and weigh 116 pounds. Your hair is brown with copper lights in it, and your skin is dark and soft like smoke. You were born in Chicago and studied stage work in Philadelphia. You're not married and you like popcorn cooked with plenty of butter and salt. <laughs> Sounds like Hedda Hopper. It is Hopper. In every stage and movie magazine I could find that even mentioned your name. You've played in exactly four movies but left them because your love is the stage. Let's get out of here, Terry. I've always thought someday it would come like this. Unexpectedly and nice. Mm-hmm. Where would you like to go? Oh, it doesn't matter. Just somewhere where we can... Many dates as could be crowded into the next few months. It was a whirlwind courtship, ending with... I, Jane Powers, take thee, Terence O'Rourke, for my lawful husband, to have and to hold from this day forward. Kiss me, Terry, darling, kiss me. Life is going to be too short to hold all your kisses. After a honeymoon, they bought a little house out in the valley, and Janie gave up her work. 
Two years later, she left Terry. It was the natural outgrowth of a lot of events that gradually reached a climax. The first one that led toward the break came about five months after the wedding. Terry came home from the studio one afternoon, bubbling over with news. Janie, where are you, Janie? In the patio, dear. Hello, darling. <laughs> Top of the evening. I got some wonderful news for you. Oh, what, Terry? Well, you've been wondering why I've been working so late these fast last few weeks, I trust. You said the production date and your script have been pushed up. Janie, I was lying. I've been bumming around with old Pappy Durant, the director. Oh? When Pappy starts a picture, he always asks for his own writers and gets them, see? Well, not exactly. Well, Pappy has been signed by Transcontinental and wants me with him. I'm all set. Oh, but... <laughs> now, listen. When they asked me what my salary was, I upped it exactly $350 a week. Not a word was said because Pappy asked for me. The studio didn't even bother to check it. But won't they find out the truth? Who cares? The contract is signed. <laughs> oh, baby, baby, we're on the upgrade at last. <laughs> What's the matter? I thought you'd be pleased. Terry, I don't think it's right. Why not? It isn't just this one thing alone, darling. I've noticed it in smaller things, too, ever since we've been married. You... You have your mind set on the money, Terry, on getting all you can. Is that bad? It is when it becomes your ambition. Achievement is one thing, but to pin all your hopes of happiness on the accumulation of money... In this game, it's dog-eat-dog. Get the dough if you can. It doesn't make any difference how you get it, just get it. That's greed. It isn't ambition. Well, what do you want out of life, then? A home, children, reasonable security. None of these things depend on a lot of money. Honey, I like that. I come home and tell my wife I just got a terrific raise, and this is the way she acts. I'm going to mix a drink. Terry went ahead on the picture. About the time he finished the script, the front office found out what he'd done. He was cooked as far as that studio or Pappy Durant was concerned. But it didn't make any difference to Terry. His salary was now established at $750 per week. The next job he got legitimately enough at Studio Pictures. The only thing that was even a little out of line there was the fact that he talked the story editor into buying an original and then kicked back 50% of the money he received for the sale into the story editor's pocket. One night... Terry. Yeah? I've thought and thought about the best way to tell you this. I've been over and over every procedure. For Pete's sake, what are you talking about? I've finally decided to be blunt about it. Terry, I'm going to have a baby. Didn't you hear what I said? Should I ring bells and blow whistles? We've got a lot of entertaining to do. We'll have to be seen around. But Terry... All the confounded, inopportune times for a thing like this to happen. Do you think I contracted it like, like a cold or something? Oh, Terry. Terry, what's happened to then, to make matters worse, a period of inactivity set in. Writers were laid off at all studios. One night, uh, very much at odds with the world, Terry walked into a little bar and sat down next to a young man just about his own age. Terry didn't pay much attention to him or anyone else as he gave his order. Whiskey and soda, Mac. Make it rye. Right. Coming up. Then the kid in the next stool looked around. He was pretty far gone, but... How are you? Peter Rabbit. Oh, that so? Ryan Soda. Want to talk? Lonesome with nobody to talk to. What's on your mind? Suicide. What? That's a fact. I was just trying to decide how to go about it. Come to any conclusions? Well, it'd be awful easy to walk out the door and just go on right out into traffic. Car comes along fast. Bingo. Continued next week. It has its points. Why so morbid? Okay, you ask me, I'll tell you. Well, my name's very distinctive. It's Joe Adams. Probably a couple hundred, just like it, in Los Angeles. Back where I come from, I'm considered a pretty good writer. I'm working on the same paper five, six years. So I thought I'd come out here and try the movies. You heard of the movies. May I be so bold as to inquire? Here and there. Yeah, most people have. I thought I'd knock over a writing job. No trouble at all. You know how it is. <laughs> a little optimistic, weren't you? In the face of the kind of shows they're doing these days? I can write better than that underwater. Ouch. You know what? 
Hollywood's like a great, big, beautiful dame. When she smiles at you, everything's all right. When she doesn't, there's no happiness anywhere. Yes, sir, Hollywood's a woman. She loves you, and she doesn't. A woman, huh? Sure. In a mink coat. You suppose she loves me? She wouldn't even spit on me. Well, I hope I haven't disgusted you with that word. I've been around. I can take it. Okay. I've been peddling stories from one studio to another till they close the doors and go home every time they see me coming. That's too bad. Because you've got a story that's terrific. How'd you know that? I'm psychic. Nothing professional, you understand. Want to hear it? No, but go on. Well, it begins this way. That, that kid outlined the greatest idea for a picture Terry ever heard. He didn't have to be told twice that he had stumbled onto something big. When Joe finished... Well, what do you think of it? Good, huh? You say you've never had it in a studio? Yeah. Anyone seen it? No. You got anything on paper? What do you think I write on, beaver board? The yarn's pretty good, Joe. I'd like to buy it. The reception was a little poor that time. What did you say? I'd like to buy your story. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Or should I say Mr. Warner Brothers? I'll give you... I'll give you a hundred bucks cash. All I've got in my pocket. What do you say? Turn around, mister. Let's see if you got any wings. Is it a deal? It's a deal? It's a merger. It's an act of providence. I'll even buy you a drink now. I'm part of that hundred bucks. Terry insisted Joe sign his story away right there and then. Uh, Janie was asleep when he got home, so he didn't wake her. The last thing in the world he wanted was for her to find out what he'd done. To make a long story short, he sold that yarn for $75,000 to United Studios and signed a contract to write the screenplay at $1,200 a week. I know, that sounds like an awful lot of money. And brother, it is. He told Janie the story was his own, and being madly in love with him, she believed him. Then one evening, Terry came home. The house was so quiet. Janie! Janie! Janie wasn't there. After a few minutes, he found the letter. It was sealed with his name on it, standing where he couldn't miss it. He tore the envelope open and two sheets of paper dropped out. The first one was the release Joe Adams made out in the bar, written on a barroom napkin and signed in a very shaky hand. The second was a note from Janie. Terry, I found this in the drawer of your desk when I was hunting for the checkbook. I know now where your big idea came from. I never thought you'd fall so low as to roll a drunk for his ideas. I told you a long time ago what I thought about such things as this. I'm going home to have our baby. Please don't bother to write me or come after me unless you learn what you've made of yourself, if you ever do learn. Well, that was that. Terry didn't write. He was too proud. One afternoon, about a week later, Joe Adams cornered him as he was going into the Brown Derby in Hollywood for lunch. It was the first time Terry had seen him since the... Hello, Shylock. You're looking well. Hello, Joe. How are you? Just ducky. I want to talk to you. Well, some other time. I want a little bit of that gold mountain they wheeled up and dumped in your lap for my story. Well, I can't talk to you here. See me at the studio. And be told again you're in conference? Go on, beat it! Terry turned on his heel and went on into the derby, leaving Joe standing where he was. Then it happened. By the time Terry could reach the sidewalk again, traffic was all snarled up and a growing crowd of people stared with horror at a crumpled figure lying half under a big car. How did it happen? I saw the guy walk out into the street. He, he looked like he was drunk or dazed or, or didn't rightly know what he was doing. Yeah, it'd be awful easy to walk out the door and just go on right out into the traffic. Car comes along fast and bingo. Continue next week. 
Trembling from shock, Terry went right back to his office, told his secretary not to put through any phone calls, not to admit anyone. He locked himself in. He had to think. Think. And so he had a drink. And another. But that only made things worse. No matter how Terry dodged the truth, he always came back to one conclusion. If Joe Adams died, he, Terry O'Rourke, killed him. Just as surely as if he had physically pushed him in front of that car. Whether or not Joe intended suicide had nothing to do with it. Uh, Miss Bonneman, a man by the name of Joe Adams was hurt in an accident a little while ago. See if you can find where they've taken him, will you? Mr. O'Rourke, I have information on the phone. Uh, put me through. Go ahead, please. Uh, th this is a friend of Mr. Adams. How is he? I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Adams died about an hour ago. Died? Oh. Dead. Joe Adams needed medical care, the best in the city, but he hadn't the money to pay for it. Now he's dead. Suppose you had turned back that money to Joe and confessed what you'd done. That would have meant the end of everything you've worked so hard for. It would have meant the end of Hollywood, as far as you're concerned. Nobody could expect you to do a thing like that. I'm going back to Chicago to have our baby, Terry. Please don't bother to write me or come after me. Unless you've learned what you've made of yourself. If you ever do learn. Janie, I'm very much in love with you. I love you too, darling, distractingly. I'm serious. You don't know me. We were only introduced a few minutes ago. I, Jane Powers, take thee, Terence O'Rourke, for my lawful husband. Kiss me, Terry, darling, kiss me. Life is going to be too short to hold all of your kisses. What do you want out of life, Janie? A home, children, reasonable security. None of these depend on a lot of money. How do you like that? I come home and tell my wife I got a terrific raise and this is the way she acts. I'm going to mix a drink. Oh, Terry, Terry, what's happening to you? Oh, God, if I could only go back and do things over. Yeah. This is Miss Bonneman. Please unlock the door. Yeah. The watchman told me you spent the night here at the office. That was nice of him. Uh, Mr. O'Rourke, in regard to that Mr. Adams... I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to talk about him. I don't want to hear his name. He's dead. A. Joe Adams is. An old man who was run over way down in the south end of town. What did you say? It occurred to me, after you talked to General Hospital, that Adams is a very common name, so I did a little more checking. Another Joe Adams, a young man, was run down outside the Brown Derby yesterday about noon and was taken to the Hollywood Receiving Hospital, not to General. D do you know what you're saying? He was treated for shock and bruises and then discharged. Uh, he's all right? Yes. He, he isn't, isn't dead? No. Miss Bond, where's my checkbook? Oh, 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 here, I... Now, you can find where Joe Adams lives. Give him this check. The, the second Adams, please, not, not the first. But, Mr. O'Rourke... It's for $75,000. Yes, and, and write out in your own words what I'm going to say now, and I'll sign it. I, Terry O'Rourke, wish to resign immediately from United Studios. Having secured my job here by fraud and false pretenses. I realize this doesn't whitewash the wrong I've done, but... Well, the real author of the story I sold you was a man by the name of Joe Adams. <laughs>
that was yesterday. Terry O'Rourke was a lucky guy and he knew it. You can imagine the excitement when that story broke. I don't know where Terry is now. I called his home just before the broadcast and received no answer. But I have a message for him, if he happens to be listening in. He has a son, born in Chicago just one hour ago. Congratulations, Terry. Don't stay away too long. Hollywood might surprise you in the way she feels now since she knows the truth. Not everyone here has the courage to admit he was wrong. Good night, everybody. American Airlines flight two for Chicago, New York, loading at gate three. All aboard, please. Your ticket, please, sir? Oh, yes, Mr. O'Rourke. Quite a break getting a cancellation at the last moment, wasn't it? Hurry, Terry, hurry. Again, here is your family theater host, Fred Allen. You know, during the play, I was thinking about the way it sometimes happened that everything seems to go wrong. I mean, you have a definite plan of what you want, of how things should go, but despite your best efforts, you can't make things go right. And in families, it happens that way, too. Homes break up. Nobody ever planned it that way because everybody starts planning a happy home. But happiness can't be all of our own making. We need God's help. Yes, all of us do. And we can have that help simply for the asking. Ask and you shall receive. That's the power of prayer. That's the wonderful help that every home can have through family prayer. Daily family prayer means God is there in your home. It means the joy of sharing your happiness with others. It means God's blessing on your home. And with God's blessing, the family that prays together stays together. Good. Our grateful thanks to Dan Daly, Ada Hopper, and Fred Allen for their appearances, and to James Griffin Jay for writing our play. Original music was scored and conducted by Max Tear. This production of Family Theater Incorporated was directed by David Young. The supporting cast included Eve McVeigh, Al Gerard, Harry Bartell, Tyler McVeigh, Ann Tobin, and Lee Arnold. Next week, our Family Theater star will be Edmund Gwen in The Leprechaun Who Didn't Listen. Your host will be Ray Milan. This series of the Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program and by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need. Be with us next week at the same time when Ray Milan and Edmund Gwen will star on Family Theater. Your announcer, Merrill Ross. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.